Thank you for being here. As most events begin with hearing from an indigenous leader, I am going to read an excerpt from Flat Elk's reading. Then I was standing on the highest mountain of them all, and round beneath was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in a sacred manner the shape of all things of the spirit, and the shapes as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that make one circle, as we just saw, a beautiful circle, white as daylight and starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy. We honor Mother Earth and see the vision of Black Elk, that all life living in harmony as one being together is a vision worth working to bring into reality. Touch the 
to fight for a habitable world, for a just and clean energy future for all. And when there's an emergency, our better angels rise to the occasion. And this is an emergency, and people are rising. Though the U.S. is backed out of the Paris Climate Accord, mayors and governors are nonetheless making ambitious pledges in cities and states to reduce emissions along with the rest of the world. So far, 51 cities have joined a campaign led by the Sierra Club promising to convert to 100% renewable energy. Woo! Thankfully, renewables will be consistently cheaper than fossil fuels by 2020, so it's an economic no-brainer. Just last week, a judge ruled the people breaking the law to prevent construction of a frac gas pipeline in Massachusetts acted out of necessity to prevent the greater harm of climate chaos so they won't be charged with crime. That's a big deal. This last Friday, the Department of Environmental Conservation denied the permit for the local frack gas millions pipeline, thanks to the fierce activists that have been fighting that. Governor Cuomo announced for Earth Day a 50% increase in new energy efficiency standard, which is an important step forward. But tomorrow, thousands of New Yorkers from all over the state are heading to Albany to tell him he needs to do much more. They will demand that he walks the talk on climate and stops all fracking infrastructure projects, makes corporate polluters pay, and moves to 100% renewable energy. We only get 3% of our electricity from wind and solar right now. There are lots of people who really care, are working hard to find solutions and to push for aggressive legislation needed to prevent the worst effects of climate change. But there's still a lot of work to do to get more people on board. To change everything, we need everyone. I think the NYC is working with chapters in 188 countries trying to build a climate movement large enough to make an impact. You can join us at 350nyc.org. We work in coalition with lots of grassroots groups around the city and the state, all doing great work and winning battles one battle at a time. One big victory we won recently after a six-year grassroots campaign to get fossil fuels divested from the city pension funds has given us real hope. Controller Scott Stringer and Mayor de Blasio have announced they will begin the process of divesting $5 billion of fossil fuel investments from the New York City pension funds. Yeah! Woo! Plus, they are suing five fossil fuel companies for damages caused by climate change. And their bold announcements are having a major global impact. Governor Cuomo, just for Earth Day, has called for divest... Has, uh, I would, Governor Cuomo has called for divesting the New York State retirement funds for fossil fuels, but the decision is up to the state controller, Thomas Napoli. He still needs convincing. So call, tweet, and write controller Tom DiNapoli and tell him to divest now. He needs to be a leader. We have a bill in the New York State level that's 100% clean energy by 2030. There's going to be a lobby day on May 8th. Please join us. You know, the entire East Coast can now be powered by offshore wind alone, but we have to get down to it. We have the solutions. We just need to convince the politicians to implement them as soon as possible. And don't forget to use your power at the polls. Vote for the climate. It will affect everything else you care about. It's time to stand up and say enough is enough. 
another world is possible. So let's rise. Thank you, Lena. Lena was the first group to start working on divestment fossil fuels. So it's a real achievement what we have now. I would just like to share with you information about another youth climate group. And this is called Our Children's Trust. And these 17 plaintiffs are suing the federal government for the right to a livable climate. Yes. Yay. Our Children's Trust. These children, I am so amazed by the youth of today. And so Our Children's Trust, their case is moving up to the courts. And they are going to be having a rally July 21st in Washington, D.C. That's a Saturday. Watch for details. Go there if you may, if you can, and support their good work for all of us. Our next speaker is also a youth from a group that he actually started. He is one of the founders of Zero Hour which is another youth group working on climate. Xanagy is a high school senior from Connecticut, so he's made his way here from Connecticut. He will attend Brown University this fall with plans to study political science. Xanagy is a founding member of Zero Hour for making his family recycle, yay, to founding his school's first Sustainability Committee, Xanagy has cared about fighting pollution and climate change for years. Yeah. I am here representing uh, my group Zero Hour, and my name is Zanaji Artis. I'm an 18-year-old from Connecticut, um, and I helped found our group last summer. Um, and this summer, we're going to be holding a rally and a march on July 21st on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. So if you can get out there in the summer, uh, we'd love you to be there. And where can I hear about it? Uh, yeah, so our website is thisiszerohour.org, um, and you can sign up to volunteer on there, you can RSVP for the march, and you can also find our social media links on there too, at This Is Zero Hour. So, yeah. Uh, zero Hour is a climate group, um, and basically uh, our slogan, zero, This Is Zero Hour, uh, basically means that this is, uh, We've run out of time to fight the climate crisis, and so we, the youth, are basically leading a group called Zero Hour, and uh, young people are going to be running this event. So what are your demands? Do you want to do a Um, so there's a question about uh, what the climate crisis actually is. So some of our asks are uh, making the uh, economy 100% uh, sustainable um, by 2028. And we want to do this because we think that the fossil fuel industry has too much influence in politics, um, but also because uh, sustainable energy is far better for the environment than fossil fuels. And we've kn we know this because scientists have been studying the uh, environment for the past hundred years, and we know that uh, burning fossil fuels creates greenhouse gases that trap heat in the atmosphere and all that, um, and that's warming our climate, which is bad for the environment. Um, so this summer in DC, we're gonna be lobbying uh, Congress people on the 19th, um, and Basically, those are going to be our two asks. So we're going to ask them to stop taking money from the fossil fuel industry, and we're going to uh, ask for them to push for a plan, a 10-year plan to move towards sustainable energy and move away from the fossil fuel industry. Thank you so much, Xanagy, for taking the time to drive all the way from Connecticut, and your friend drove with you, right? Yeah, it was his brother. Oh, your brother, yeah. great. Let's give him a nice big hand. Yeah. For taking the time to make the trip all the way from Connecticut to help us celebrate Mother Earth. Um, I would like to tell you while we're still on climate and I'm vice chair of Sierra Club, New York City group, that, that we have a new campaign called Clean Energy for All, which is made up of four previous campaigns, uh, Beyond Call, Electric vehicles, dirty fuel, 
and ready for 100. That's 100%. So I just want to tell you about that. And now I have a very, very exciting announcement to make. And that is we have a very special guest with here today, with us today. <clears throat> and Valentina Osa was going to be speaking, fifth grader. She wrote a speech. When I read it, I was moved to tears. And it's called Speech for Earth Day. And Valentina, unfortunately, recently got a concussion. So we send her our best wishes and say we hope you are resting, Valentina. But guess what? Her grandmother is here, Mary Beth Yarrow. Please Woo! come up, Mary Beth. And you may recognize the name Yarrow. Thank you. And Mary Beth is the mother, or well, the wife, of Peter Yarrow, of Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the mother of Bethany Yarrow, who is the mother of Valentina. <laughs> <coughs> so we give her a nice <coughs> welcome, and she's going to read her granddaughter. Right, thank you, Beth. You're thank you, everybody. My name is Mary Beth Yarrow, and I am the grandmother of my 11-year-old daughter, Valentina Osa, who was supposed to be here today to give this speech that she wrote, has spent the last couple of weeks working on and thinking about. And on Thursday, a door banged into the back of her head and she has a concussion and can't be here. Rachel and Leah, I want you to come up here and stand. We've got an opportunity to say this again. We waited for you. These are Valentina's friends and, yeah. and, and sisters um, in, in this effort. Um, this is Rachel and Leah Jones. And, and I'm so glad that um, we didn't have a microphone until now so that you could be here. Can I, can I take this out of the... Okay, there we go. So, Valentina is 11 years old. I am on my way to 71 years old. We are bookends of the Yarrow family. It is my honor to be here today to read this in Valentina's stead. She wrote, hello, my name is Valentina Osa. I am 11 years old and in the fifth grade. I was born in New York City and I live in Brooklyn. I know everyone here is here for a reason. Whether it's climate change, fracking, or pollution. I often think about what the world would be like if we humans hadn't taken over. If humans hadn't murdered, raped, and abused. Can you imagine how different the world would be today if humans lived in harmony and peace with each other and other living creatures on this planet. I am here today to stand for all the people who don't have the courage, awareness, or opportunity to stand up for themselves. For all the kids my age who, haven't, who have been told over and over again that they are too young to make a change. I am also here for the people who are doing this to our earth. I am not here to tell them that my way is the only right way, is the only right way or that they are bad people. I am just trying and hoping that they open their eyes and see what they what, see what they are doing is to the earth. I want them to think I want them to think that the, uh, the I want them to think about the earth that future generations will inherit. If we don't stop now, who will have clean water to drink, air to breathe, an ocean to swim in? All these things are rights, not privileges. Everyday children are suffering because they don't have clean water, 
and they are worried for their lives. Is this the kind of world we want to grow up in? Animals and plants are becoming extinct at a faster rate than ever before. If they are dying, so can we. I remember the first time my mom told me about fracking. I was five years old and I just, just cried and cried. I had a fear of what it would be like when I was older. I had a fear that people were doing this to the earth and that they wouldn't stop. I had a fear that we weren't just doing this to us, but that we were doing it to all of the animals and all the organisms. The It just went against life itself. I started doing research and every time I got more angry. I needed to do something. I asked my mom if I could write Governor Cuomo a letter asking him to stop the fracking. I asked my mom to take me to a rally because that was something I believed in. I did everything a five-year-old could do to make a change. And we did make a change. Governor Cuomo banned fracking. But that's not enough. Climate change has gotten worse really fast, and we, made, we need to make changes faster. Governor Cuomo, we need you to stop the fracked gas compressors, compressor stations. The chemicals go into the air and poison the water, the land, humans, animals, and everything around it. We need you to stop the pipelines. We need no more fossil fuels. We need 100% renewables. You're the governor. You're the adult. Make this madness stop. In 100 years, we might not even exist anymore if we keep going at the rate we are now. Animals are dying. Forests are perishing. People are getting angrier. We're throwing down bombs that destroy cities and not even thinking. We are drilling into the earth like it doesn't matter. Like the earth is just a thing that we can throw away and get another one. We can't. If we destroy this earth, there is no turning back. There is not another one. Look what we are doing. We're trying to go to Mars because we didn't take care of this planet, because we just destroyed it. People are just taking what they want for greed and money and power. It needs to stop or we won't have a world left. So once again, I ask you to repeat after me, I stand for the water. I stand for the water. I stand for the children. I stand for the children. I stand for the air. I stand for the air. I stand for the animals. I stand for the animals. I stand for the forests. I stand for the earth. I stand for the earth. I stand for life. I stand for life. I hope you will stand with me. I hope you will stand with me. And you too, Governor Cuomo. And you too, Governor Cuomo. I really hope you will stand with all of us. I really hope you will stand with all of us. Valentina, we stand with you. Valentina, we stand with you. Thank you. And happy Mother Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you. And now, one of Bethany's favorite songs to sing, speaking of standing, is We Shall Not Be Moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree. That's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Everybody. We 
shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Because for the earth has four lives, we'll protect her. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. To find the sign above our heads. We work to keep it clean. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. For now and for all the children who work to save Earth now. Very good. Uh, so we're going to go now to our next speaker, who is John Mermelstein. Am I saying that correctly, John? Yep. Okay. And, uh... John is a graduate student at Columbia Teachers College, getting his master's degree in social studies education. John has a love for the environment <clears throat> that comes from his activist mother and spending time outdoors where he developed a deep love for nature. He is now particularly concerned about the growing insect population and worked on the divestment for fossil fuels campaign at SUNY Binghamton. Let's give a nice round of applause for John. Hello. I think young people as a whole are starting to realize that this old image of environmental problems is something in the future, like some abstract idea, you know, maybe in 30 years our kids will have it worse. No, it's right. I'd just rather yell than use this mic, I'm sorry. Um, and this is a problem that it's literally right now, right? It's affecting every single one of us today. The last, the seasons show that climate is giving us crazy weather that we're not used to. And even more than the day to day, we have more extreme weather than we've ever had. So what's happening right, and right now in Puerto Rico shows that not only are we having more extreme weather, but that the victims of extreme weather are disproportionately poor people of color. Let me ask you, have you ever heard of a rich person suffering from an environmental problem? Has it ever happened? Never. Every single time there's an environmental problem, the people who bear the burden, the people who actually suffer from them, are poorer folks generally of color. So right now there are two extreme examples of this, but Puerto Rico is a very urgent one. And then of course we have DAPL being built in the Dakotas, in South Dakota. So we see that the native folks who we have already exploited our entire existence are now going to be bearing the brunt of our fossil fuel construction project when we should be moving toward 100% renewable energy. So we see, yeah, yeah, 100% renewable energy, let's go! So beyond just America, we see that in the middle, is this? Okay. Cool, cool. So we see that right now, Trump is doing his Syria thing and the whole context of the Syria crisis is climate change. Is the fact that they had an extreme drought, and because of an extreme drought, agricultural prices skyrocketed, and farmers lost their jobs. As farmers lose their jobs, they flock into the cities. We have urban boom, prices of housing skyrockets, prices of food skyrockets. That creates a climate of unrest under which the Syrian civil war rose out of. So we see that climate change is having enormous geopolitical ramifications. You could say ISIS is a product of climate change. Controversial statement, but I will defend it. So there's an urgency to tackling this problem. There's an urgency to, when I say climate justice, when we think of climate justice, we think of who are the victims. And the fact that it is disproportionately people of color, that gives us, those of us, I see mostly white people here, we have an obligation to take this seriously because we are in a position of privilege we cannot just sit and watch and have the luxury to not care. We have an urgency to take action. So, I want to end on a hopeful note. I think 2018 does give us a really cool opportunity to change the narrative of climate activism for all of these reasons. Because of the urgency of 2018, because of the optically obvious nature of an intransigent federal government that doesn't have our interest in mind, 
doesn't have our interests in mind because they are taking the corporate donations. And it's not just Republicans who take these donations, to be completely clear. Democratic politicians, including Governor Cuomo, take massive contributions from country, companies like Exelon. So as we see that there's an urgency to the problem, we see that the victims are predominantly poorer folks of color. There's an opportunity for coalition building that's been absent in the environmental movement. Throughout, throughout my whole childhood, there's been this narrative of environmental activism that it's generally white folks who don't have any real problems, so they're like thinking about the future, thinking about some abstract issue, and that's not the case. What we have in climate activism now, whether it's in Puerto Rico, whether it's at DAPL, whether it's in Montana, whether it's in Nevada, we have folks who are defending their own communities, who are asserting their own rights. And that gives the environmental activism movement an opportunity to reach out to folks who we haven't had the opportunity to reach out to yet. So I want to shout out 350.org. Is Lena still here? Yeah, 350. So I, I used to live in Seattle, Washington, where 350.org is doing something really awesome there committing to a housing movement to build more affordable housing in Seattle, uh, especially affordable housing for underserved communities. Because climate, because housing is a climate issue. If we can have urban populations that actually support people to live the way they need to live, they won't have to go to suburbs, they won't need to drive cars, they won't need to consume more land. So if we can effectively have sustainable communities, we can tackle climate change. So that gives us the opportunity to build coalitions. and. I want to shout out my mom who really demonstrated building coalitions. Can we make some noise for Michelle Lee, please? So, nuclear energy is obviously a, like a niche market in the environmental activism community. And in 2001, when my mom started doing environment, uh, nuclear work, many environmentalists didn't have nuclear on their radar whatsoever. So what the, environment, what the nuclear movement has had to do is reach out to various aspects of the environmental movement, whether it's the anti-fracking movement, whether it's indigenous rights groups, whether it's climate change groups, getting Sierra Club involved, getting 350.org, getting Greenpeace, and being able to say, we need to think about climate change in more broad terms than we have. And that's the note I want to leave us on. Talk to the people around you. Get through the awkwardness of talking to strangers. Reach out, be sociable, build coalitions. Let's do this. Yeah. Uh, we're still on the theme of justice before we move to number here. Kate Whitman is here, and Kate Whitman is another of our youth who has been working so hard, and I don't know about you, but I'm totally blown away about how our youth have been taking charge with all these serious issues. So, Kate. So, I just want to read to you a word about Kate. Whitman is a youth <coughs> who helped lead a citywide high school walkout in 2016. And she also was part of the Women's March Youth Empower Team, which led the Enough Walkout for Gun Control on March 14th. That saw almost 2.7 million students walking out. And she studies acting at LaGuardia High School, which is right up the road. Here you go, Kate. Okay. Let's have a nice hand for Kate. Yeah. Um, I'm Kate Whitman, and I'm 17, and I'm one of the leaders of Women's March Youth Empower, um, which branches off of Women's March. Um, but most importantly, I'm one of the tens of millions of young people who have become increasingly politically active in the last few years. Um, there are more than 20 million Americans between the ages of 16 and 22 today. And in recent months, we have consistently shown up to protests and marches to voice our opinions and our demands. Today, on Earth Day, we're doing the same. We realize the power that we possess to make America better for everyone and to make the world better for everyone. Legislators and politicians have also realized that power. However, they are moving slowly. They're waiting to see if we can sustain our energy, our level of passion, and to see if we can apply it to multiple issues. There we, uh, I'm here to tell them today that we can and we will. 
We have the capacity and the commitment to bring about change on a wide range of issues, the environment being one of the most important. Young people are the ones who are going to inherit the consequences of the decisions made by our politicians today, and as the previous speaker said, we are already seeing these consequences. The way things are going, we will be inheriting a damaged ozone layer, plastic islands, and a food chain missing some of its most valuable parts. But I have good news. Young people turn into young voters. And it is our duty to vote out those who see the world around us as disposable, as something that they can cash out to fill up their bank accounts. It is also our duty to vote in people who see the world and our environment as it is, as beautiful and as fragile. This is an issue that crosses all political, social, and economic boundaries. It is an issue based not on opinion, but on scientific fact. It is an issue that needs to be addressed right now by all of us, by young people, by students, by teachers, by parents, and most importantly, legislators. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind that young people will be voting in the upcoming elections and voting for people who represent our best interests. That's right. Environmental change will come, and legislators will either work with us or be voted out. Yay! Yeah. Woo! Woo! I will leave you with a quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much, Kate. And now we are going to go to our third theme, which is no nuclear. And we will hear from John's mother, Michelle Lee. And Michelle Lee is an attorney. She is a senior policy analyst at prompting promoting health and sustainable energy or phase and she is also a member of the nuclear consulting group ncg an international inter multidisciplinary group of nuclear experts and serves on the board of directors of the nuclear information and resource service news and also as i said john's mother let's give a nice hand for michelle lee years ago, certainly wasn't true 10 years ago, but, but it is true now that we technologically, we technologically now have the capacity to really make huge, huge advancements towards a truly clean energy economy. Yeah. That is the Woo! actual scientific truth. So the next thought in all of your minds is political truth. But I do not subscribe to the belief that political change is impossible. Everything is impossible until it becomes possible. And what that will mean, though, is, and this is really something we have to all take to heart, that means we have to come together. Every, every wing of the sustainable earth movement, every wing of the community movement, the labor movements, the student movements, the women movements, everyone who wants a world where we can enjoy beautiful days like this in parks and have waters that are clean. It is, should be a human right for everybody to be able to go swimming in a, a water body near where they live. There shouldn't be a single creek which, which yeah. is so toxic <laughs> that you could get poisoned. And I wasn't even talking about this, but it, it just brought back to mind. When I was in high school, um, my friend Lori, and we were on the uh, other side of the Hudson River, and she slipped into the Hudson River. And she came out with a chemical burn all over her body. She had to be hospitalized from slipping into the chemical and to the Hudson River. And in the ensuing decades, environmental groups and, and fishermen and, and people who make a living from the, from the river got together and the Hudson River is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and further upstate you can swim in it now in the Croton Woo! area. Yeah. On the other hand, in the Croton area you have Indian Point which is pumping radioactivity and thermal pollution into the river every single day. 
And to give you just a sense of the scope of that kind of pollution, the thermal pollution, the heat that a nuclear plant needs to keep hot cooling systems going, is the equivalent of detonating a Hiroshima-sized atomic bomb into the river every single week of every single year, decade after decade after decade. That has been going on now for over 40 years, that amount of heat, okay? It goes all the way up. We have thermal imaging that shows how the heat plume goes up and down the river. Another thing, water resources. Water is become, becoming crucially important globally now that we have climate change and high population levels, is waters, source water, drinking water. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem that is very complex, but we're going to be in a situation, we're going to have a lot more situations like Flint, Michigan, if we don't start taking our water systems critically, critically important. At Indian Point, it, the amount of water it sucks in is the equivalent of all the water in the Hudson River from the point we are standing in now, the Statue of Liberty right over there, all the way past Albany. All that water, that volume of water, if you can even like begin to conceptualize that, gets sucked into intake system, and that's true with every single nuclear power plant in the world. So, and that's pulling in and killing billions of fish and larvae, so you have the direct damage to the environment. In addition, the radiation gets pumped out by nuclear power plants constantly as part of normal operation. And guess what our wonderful federal regulations that have been in place since the 1950s protect against? And only for cancer, and only for Al allowing a certain amount of cancers, that's considered okay. But it comes from something called the REM, the reference, it's a reference man standard that came out of the Manhattan Project developing the atomic bomb. Who were the scientists? They were white men in their 20s. So the entire standard for health is based on white male of about between 20 and 30, uh, 170 pounds. Do you think everybody is a white male in their 20s at 170 pounds? Or do you think maybe there are some human beings that don't quite fit that description? Among the human beings that don't fit that description are women. Um, a few years ago, the National Academies of Science did an analysis um, on low-level radiation. And it turns out that women are substantially more vulnerable to the effects of radiation than men. And little girls are four times more vulnerable than men. Then you, as you go through the human development change, the fetus, babies, toddlers, uh, in 2008, Germany did a study of leukemia, childhood leukemia, around, and it found that every single nuclear plant, around every single nuclear plant in Germany, childhood leukemia rates were elevated because children are more susceptible to radiation than adults. So this is a gender issue, and it is absolutely an environmental justice issue. The mining is devastating, not, especially Navajo, but, but all American communities, because that's where the uranium mines are uh, in, in the United States. In other countries, it's devastating areas in Africa, uh, Australia, it's in the indigenous community areas, of course, where the mining is done. These people are being poisoned. The mining activities are, are going into the air, into the water, into the soil. Children are playing in the soil, and those peoples are sick, and they're not getting the attention they deserve. During nuclear power emissions, and this is something most environmentalists do not know, because it is not monitored by the industry, and it is not required to be monitored by the federal government. But during the process of fission, 
as the, the, the fission process goes on inside the, the, the reactor core, radioactive carbon is created. Radioactive carbon-14 in some plants and radioactive methane in others. Radioactive carbon, and this is new carbon that has never existed in nature. It is man-made carbon, it is radioactive, it is poisonous for decades, and because carbon is what we are all made of, it is very easily incorporated into our cells. In areas of Chernobyl, where there was, a, in 1986, there was a nuclear meltdown in the former Soviet Union. You had two, over 250, and this was a rural area, 250,000 people had to be evacuated. An area 1,000 square miles is permanently uninhabitable from between, they're saying, between 300 and 900 years. So just to give you a sense of scope, if there was a nuclear power accident at Indian Point, that would pretty much wipe out the New York metropolitan area for centuries as a livable, livable communities. In, Shun in Fukushima, in Japan, which happened in 2011, in March 2011, what saved Japan was wind, thank God. There was something called westerly winds, which blew 80% of the radioactive plumes over into the Pacific. Now, what that will create is a long-term Pacific radioactive pollution crisis, and probably a long-term crisis with, with things such as sushi and seaweed, and it, that, that goes into the global food, food chain, right? But the population of Japan Probably, Japan is a nation, and I, and I will tell you, just use a short quote from Nato Khan, who was a former prime minister of Japan during the Fukushima crisis. And he said that during the crisis, he asked the top experts to come around and tell him what the worst case scenario was. And he realized that as a nation, Japan would no longer be able to cease to, it would cease to exist as a nation. Hospitals gone, schools gone, communities gone. That even the greater Tokyo metropolitan area would have to be evacuated. If you look at Japan, these are little islands, right? Continuation, I'm going to leave on one point, which I think in a, in a way is the most important. And I guess two things. One thing I should say is in addition to the carbon emissions that are created during nuclear power, which is not monitored, so nobody knows the extent of it, but this is not a debatable source. This is in the, the industry literature, and, and it, it's not just you know some environmental coop talking about it. This is known, but it's not monitored, so we don't know how much carbon that is. But we do know that during the mining process, there are massive amounts of, of energy car carbon used, as well as the actual radioactive pollution, and that the waste we are creating lasts for th millennia. I, I, that one reason why people don't grasp nuclear is because the concepts are almost beyond our conception. 10,000 years ago, this area was covered by ice. It was the Ice Age. So that was 10,000 years ago. The glaciers began to retreat about 20,000 years ago. Plutonium, one of the most dangerous of the all radionuclides, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. Okay, what kind of hubris, are, what, what are we playing with where we're creating a toxic product that has a half-life and a full life of nearly a quarter million years? And that has to be kept for the environment, according to National Academy of Sciences, for a million years. You know, we cannot get our act together on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have to cr creating waste that is going to put people in jeopardy for a million years. This does not make sense to me. 
Um, and I think a key thing that we all have to do in the environmental community is inform each other. We're all in our little silos. You know, there's the anti-pipeline people and the anti-fracking and the anti-nuclear. We got it. That's gone. Those days are gone. We don't have the luxury for silos anymore. We have to come together. Yeah. We are come, coming together and we're going to fight and we're going to win. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle. It was such a body of knowledge. Many of you here today helped work to shut down Any Point Now, which is coming 2019, 2021, right? Reactor one and no, number two. And we still have to be careful of Three Mile Island upstate near the, uh, <coughs> uh, the Great Lakes. There's reactors one and two, there's Ghanai, and there's Fitzpatrick. And Governor Cuomo would like us to pay something like, I may not have this figure correct, six, seven point eight billion with a B dollars to bail out those nuclear power plants that are aging and ready to be closed. Yeah, so that's ratepayer money. That's yeah, and that's ratepayer money, taxpayer money. So we have to be aware of that. And if you think of it, if you're talking to Governor Cuomo, ask him not to do this. There's been a big campaign to stop that. Okay, and now we're going to just touch briefly. I know some of you may be getting tired. We're coming near our home stretch. Uh, legislation is something that can help. Amongst other things, legislation could work two ways. One, people could be so angry about something, they work to make a law to change it. For example, the smoking laws. As soon as they found out secondhand smoking was destructive to our health, they got laws to change it. The other way it works is people who aren't aware now have a law that they have to obey, and hopefully they will become aware. And as you all know, climate change has caused many laws to go into effect that are needed, and we need many more. We have, as I think uh, Zanaji mentioned, the Paris Climate Agreement. I was there in Paris in 2015. We, the United States, is the only country in the world that has not signed on to it. <laughs> but you should know that the cities and states are effectively keeping us in this agreement by working on lowering their greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiency, and so forth. Okay, uh, and now in regards to um, legislation, we have with us Tiff Fernandez. Tiff, yes, and Tiff is with Food and Water Watch, is now going to tell us about the federal legislation off off fossil fuels. Tiff is an activist and legislative strategist who led passage of the Massachusetts Brownfields Act and campaigned to file the LGBT Equality Act, now co-sponsored by 240 House and Senate members. Tiff has a Master's of Law in Human Rights in Africa and has produced his own musical in the New York Fringe Festival. Please give Tiff a nice applause. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Earth Day 2018. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here today because I'm going to tell you about a new campaign and plan to defeat big oil. This plan has two major components to it. The first is a major piece of vanguard legislation to implement the Paris Agreement. Um, we're going to outlaw pollution nationwide, and we're going to mandate 100% renewable energy by 2035. The second piece of the plan is a climate war room that we're launching in New York City where we're going to meet every Monday night from June 4th through the election every week in coalition and we are going to fight to call the question with Congress members and candidates alike across the country. Are you for big oil or are you for the planet? This is the question we are going to call. The first part of this is the bill to implement the Paris Agreement. Now this is a big deal. It was filed recently a few months ago. It's led by Representative Gabbard, a great congresswoman from the state of Hawaii. It has 33 co-sponsors already. It is the solution, it is an actual solution to climate change. It is the bill to re-engineer our economy. And it has a deep call for social justice. I'm going to read just a little bit of the bill. The bill opens. It's called the Off Fossil Fuels Act. Repeat that with me. The Off Fossil Fuels Act. Off Fossil Fuels Act. It's called the Off Act for short. O-F-F. -F, off Fossil Fuels. Off. They came up with that, not me. I think it's cute. Um, 
The bill starts open with a, a recitation of some of the horror, horror stories, the truth of how pollution is unequally distributed in this country. Of 11 million people who live near a polluting facility, 50% of them are people of color. Children of color are three times more likely to go to the hospital with an emergency asthma attack than white children. In Corpus Christi, Texas, the birth rate birth defect rate is 84% higher than in the rest of the state, a Latin community with a lot of polluted companies involved. And 25% of Superfund sites in the United States, 25% of them are, are in Indian, Indian lands, which are only 4% of the country. The bill starts with that statement as a bow and apology to these communities for the nightmare that we have perpetrated on them. Shame on America. Then it says, it is the sense of Congress that the United States must transition to a 100% clean energy economy. Two, it is not in the national interest of taxpayers of the United States to subsidize highly profitable polluting fossil fuel companies. Three, it is imperative that the United States make extensive investments in grid modernization projects across the country. Skipping to 12, we strongly endorse the principles of environmental justice adopted at the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. Finally, it goes on in 22, I'm skipping to say, we know that green collar jobs are the present and future of industry, and these jobs must include the ability for workers to collectively bargain. 26, without equivocation, we must not only create new jobs for workers who have lost work, but we must ensure that those jobs are good jobs, meaning they pay a family sustaining wage, they provide health care and retirement benefits. And 27, the last opening, we have the technology, we have the technology to transition to 100% renewable energy right now. All that is missing is the political and social will. And that's what we're going to start be developing. Then the OFF Act, it proceeds to do real incredible things. I'm just going to pile them off for you. One, mandates 100% renewable energy nationwide by 2035 and 80% by 2028. It mandates electric cars and trains by the same dates. It bans all pipelines and infrastructure in the country. All new infrastructure and pipelines. No more pipelines. It ends all federal tax subsidies for the oil industry. All of them. Out. It bans oil and gas exports. No more oil and ga gas exports. It mandates the right to unionize for green workers. It creates a real support system and funding for workers hurt by this transition and establishes a real seat at the table for local tribes, community justice groups, and frontline communities, vesting them with power to decide how money is spent and how the clean energy plans are made. It's an amazing bill, it really is. I couldn't believe it when I first read it. It's only 22 pages, 10 of which are the findings of facts and 10 of which are the, the law these, I just read to you. It's that short, it's that incredible. And it works in the smartest way possible. It mandates that the electric companies buy 100% renewable, solar, wind, geothermal, and tidal only. No nuclear. And so it, it works just like when you get the right to opt in to clean energy on your bill. Instead of us individually having to do that, it mandates that all the electric companies nationwide buy 100% renewables. That's how we're going to fix it. And then the private sector comes in and develop, de, you know, de, will deliver that on schedule. Um, so in the last thing, the icing on the cake, the whole transition from R&D grants to community development and new energy infrastructure is funded by ending the offshore corporate tax loopholes. Hello? This is like a, a candy store for environmental activists, union workers, children's health advocates, anti-corporate Occupy Wall Street activists, and practically every social justice cause in America. It's time to fight. There's nothing more powerful than ID who's come, and that's what's happening with the climate movement. The climate movement, after 50 years, has hit a crest on the wave, and we're about to ride into, New York, into Washington, D.C. like a tsunami coming up. There's going to be a blue wave coming, and there's going to be a feminist wave coming to New York with over 500 women vote, running for office in the House and Senate, and there's going to be a climate tsunami. This is the time. We're in the middle of a organizing an activist zeitgeist, Occupy Wall Street, 
Black Lives Matter, LGBT rights, women rising, youth uprising, and all of these relate to climate change. Because climate change is not just a human rights issue. Climate change is every human rights issue. Now the most important point I'm gonna to make today right now is the timing, and this is horrifying, and I had no idea two years ago when I really started digging deep into this movement that this was the case. I had no idea of the timeline for between, until when we pass, surpass the two degree limit of the Paris Agreement. We have, as it turns out, 20 years more pollution. Our pollution, the pollution that we pump into the air over the next 20 years will determine the fate of humanity for the next centuries to come. It's our pollution. We've kicked this can down the road for 30 years. Congress has known about this since the 70s. By 1988, they knew it was man-made. They've done nothing because we didn't have the power. We have the power now. And we're gonna, make, we're gonna, we're gonna use that power. Um, so now at the action plan. We have an action plan, we're gonna escalate this action. Oh, before I go on the timeline, 20 years more pollution before we hit enough pollution in the air to, to obligate us to two degrees warming. In six years, we will have put enough pollution in the air to take us past the 1.5 degree warming. Between 1.5 and 2 degrees warming, we face 15 tipping points in this world. Ocean currents are going to change. Ice sheets are going to melt. After which a series of dominoes come into play that we will have no control over and no ability to stop and no ability to prepare for. So this is an emergency. And the timelines in this bill of 80% by 2035 and 100% by 20, I mean 100% by 2035 and 80% by 2028 are real deadlines tied to the science. And we keep telling everybody, listen to the science, listen to the science. The movement needs to listen to the science right now and the scientists are telling us it's now or never. So we have an action plan to go with the solution. You just heard the solution. The action plan is a climate war room every Monday starting June 4th. June 4th, every Monday in Chelsea, we have a fabulous location on 18th Street. Um, a fancy furniture store is gonna offer their space to us every Monday night for five months through the election. And we have two goals. It's Food and Water Wash and 350 NYC that are partnering with this and other allies like Sunrise and other groups. We're gonna be coming together every week, every week, every week, and we're gonna demand that every con candidate for Congress nationwide take two pledges. One is the OFF Act that I just told you about, a pledge to take the OFF Act. We already have 100 candidates that have taken that pledge. The other pledge is the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. And this is being spearheaded by 350 and other organizations. It says basically candidates promise not to take any oil money. And these two pledges together call the question, are you for big oil or are you for the planet? And so we need everybody to show up every Monday night, all the coalitions, all the groups. We need you to come together and help us fight this fight. We're going after every candidate for office in all 435 congressional districts. Fast forwarding, this is a David Goliath, David versus Goliath of gargantuan proportions fight. There's no doubt about it. Big oil is a huge uh, opponent. They spend $360 million a year bribing and lobbying Congress. They get $10 billion of oil tax freeze, tax subsidies, and they make $100 billion a year in profits. Um, the top five of them do. So for the activists who's fought this fight for 30 years, 40 years, thank you, you were up against everything. But the tide has changed. The zeitgeist is here. The public understands and sees climate change. We are in a different position for this fight. Even a majority of Republicans are against pollution. So this is the time to go all in. If you are for 100% renewables, this is your bill. If you are keeping it in the ground, this is your bill. If you are pipeline resistance, this is your bill. If you are divestiture, let's divest the U.S. government, this is your bill. If you are frontline community and seeking not just a place at a table, but a table with your name on it, this is your bill. And if you are a mother or a grandmother with children, this is your best hope, and we need you. History will judge this generation on our actions. Are we gonna stand by, fully aware, and let our pollution destroy humanity? bring floods, famine, fire, disease, killer heat waves and storms. Are we gonna let our pollution do this? Let the greed and the love of money destroy the Garden of Eden? No. So it's us to show up. 
We have the solution and we have the X plan, action plan. 2018, we're working hard. We're gonna get as many as we can. By 20, next 2019 and 20, we're gonna drive this home. By 21, we'll have a new house, a new White House, I'm wrapping up, and we will pass this legislation to implement the Paris Agreement, just like we passed the Paris Agreement. So I'm calling on all the climate warriors, the water defenders, the scientists, the students, and the honored grandmothers willing to heckle politicians like only grandmothers can. Everyone with that fire in their spirit that cannot wait for victory, that fire that stirs with rage at the injustice, that fire that's ready to sit in protest as long as it takes. Next year, Earth Day 2019 needs to take place on the front lawns of every congressperson in America because they have homes and families and friends who live on this planet and it's time to find out what those people think too. Until we pass this law, this Earth Bill, to save humanity and save our planet, we must rise to action and do what it takes to win. There is no time to waste and too much is at stake. Come help light this fire. Come to Climate Mondays. Let's get to work and let's call the question. Are you for big oil or are you for the planet? Now's that time. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Tiff. The only problem is I think you need to be a little more enthusiastic. What do you think? <laughs> I think we're going to do this. I really do. I have faith that uh, our young people and all people, middle people, everybody's going to do this. Uh, we have two more speakers, and then we might have some dancers coming. So I'm moving us along. Uh, but before I introduce our next speaker, Edie Kantrowitz, I, I want to ask you a question, but don't answer it now. Uh, this is one way to get our liquids, the plastic bottle. This is another way, an aluminum can. And this is a third way with a reusable bottle. Don't answer yet, but I'm going to ask you which is the worst for the planet, which is OK, and which is the best. And now I'd like to introduce Edie Kantowitz, who is with United for Action. And Edie has been president of New York City Friends for Clearwater. She's done a great job. Woo. Well, you're welcome. And Edie is stepping in to talk about New York City Council Bill 034, who Ling Tzu has been working very hard on. And Edie's going to be talking about it. Thank you, Edie. Hi. OK, so folks, uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But I'd like to tell you about one very specific and concrete and maybe it looks small, but it's a very powerful thing that you can do right away to help the environment for Earth Day, okay? We have in the city council a bill which is called Intro 135, okay? It's city council intro 135. This was introduced by council member Brad Lander and Intro 135 is the bill that would ban or restrict the sale of styrofoam polystyrene containers in New York City, okay? So it's a bill that's banning styrofoam, and I think we know that we need a ban on styrofoam, right? For many, many reasons, okay? We have a tremendous problem with our waste stream, with our litter, and actually styrofoam is one of the top 10 items that they found when they do beach cleanups worldwide. There's styrofoam out there, okay? But there's also styrofoam inside because even when styrofoam is disposed of properly, it's still, because of its nature, it's very crumbly. It can blow off of garbage trucks and it gets into the air and then it winds up not only in our landfills, but it winds up also in our sewage systems in our waterways and it winds up in the oceans okay and so what happens different types of wildlife are exposed to this material they're eating it land creatures birds um marine creatures all kinds of wildlife are eating the styrofoam and and then they die Okay, they may die because they get a blockage from a piece of styrofoam right inside them or just from the toxins that are inherent in this material, okay? Now you may not realize how toxic this is. It's a plastic. Plastics are toxic, okay? 
It has recently been shown that polystyrene, which is derived from styrene, which is what is made into styrofoam, is actually carcinogenic. And it's also derived from fossil fuels. It's a petroleum product, okay? So we certainly don't want to be using anything, if we can possibly help it, that comes from fossil fuels, right? Okay, so we have a lot of different reasons why we want to ban styrofoam, but lo and behold, the industry tells us that we can just recycle it instead. People are trying to say we can recycle the styrofoam. Do you think we can recycle the styrofoam? No. no. Okay, because styrofoam is very different from a lot of other substances. Like we said, it's crumbly, it's very porous, okay? And so if you send styrofoam to a recycling plant, first of all, it soaks up a lot of the food juices that may be on it, the grease and stuff. And not only does it come into the recycling plant dirty and make other stuff dirty, but it will pick up more liquids and substances once it's there at the recycling facility, okay? Also, the little pieces and pellets of it will blow around and actually contaminate other things that could be recyclable. So you're actually making your recycling profile worse by trying to introduce styrofoam into the mix, okay? And uh, Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia put out a very detailed report last year showing that there is no feasible way for New York City to successfully recycle styrofoam, okay? So we just want to ban this stuff. There are alternatives that are fully compostable. We can live without styrofoam. We lived without it, you know, for thousands and millions of years, okay? All right, so there are two things that I would like people to do in order to help get this ban, okay? First of all, because it's city council, I would like everybody to call their city council representative, right? And if you don't know who your city council member is, you can easily find out by just asking Google, who is my city council member? And you'll get the phone number and you can call them up. And you want to ask them to support and co-sponsor this bill. It's intro 135. And if they're already a co-sponsor for intro 135, you can thank them. But if they're not yet co-sponsoring it, then ask them to be a co-sponsor, okay? The other thing I'd like everyone to do is to call City Council Speaker Corey Johnson. And with Speaker Corey Johnson, you want to ask him not only to support the bill, but to actually bring it to the floor of the City Council for a hearing because a bill in the city council needs to go to the floor for a hearing before it can be voted on. So that's a crucial step. It needs to come for a hearing, okay? We currently have 14 co-sponsors for this bill, and with 26, we can be assured of passing a vote, okay? So this is doable, okay? City council has actually been very responsive to environmental issues. We have allies there. Okay? But we need to show them what's important to us, and we need to make these phone calls, okay? There's several different phone numbers um, for Speaker Corey Johnson, and I understand that the most effective one to call on, and I'll, I'll repeat this a few times because I see some people might be punching it into their phones, okay? It's 212-564-7700. Again, that's 212 Five six four seven seven five seven two one two five six four seven seven five seven Speaker of the City Council Corey Johnson. Okay, so please make these phone calls. You might want to make it right now before you forget. You might prefer to do it tomorrow when you can actually speak to a human being instead of just a voicemail. But please remember to make these calls for intro 135, and we can ban styrofoam in New York City. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Edie, for your good work. And just kind of a word, uh, if you have a favorite deli or store for takeout and they have styrofoam, you can have that store <coughs> get permission and you take your own container. So you get your salad or whatever it is you're gonna get in your own container so you don't have to take uh, the takeout. 
And just very briefly before I introduce the speaker for our last of our four themes uh, piece, I just want to say that Greenpeace has a big campaign, worldwide campaign, Break Free from Plastic. And I'd just like to read this to you briefly. We put the equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic into our seas every minute, every day, all year long. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is now an area three times the size of Texas. And single-use plastics contribute greatly. And microplastics, and that's like all the plastic being in the water, eventually breaks down into these minute, tiny sizes that you can't even see with the naked eye. And these microplastics are getting into all organisms through water, including ourselves. So it's time we cleaned up our act and stopped using plastics. Uh, okay, and um, now I'm just going to ask very briefly, worst, okay, and best. How many people say this is the worst we could be getting our water in? Yes, you're right, because it's at plastics. Most people do not recycle these. This is not recyclable. And this is part of what's making up the great specific ocean patch. No no plastics and we're in the process of getting the New York City Council to introduce legislation to that effect. How about aluminum? How is that? Okay. Aluminum is okay. You're right because it can be recycled and most people do recycle it. Okay and what about your own container? Yes. The best. You're right. You all pass a hundred on your test. Last of our themes is peace, and I'm going to introduce Sally Jones. And Sally Jones is chair of Peace Action Fund of New York State. And Sally helped start a chapter of Peace Action on Staten Island in 2002 where she lives. The peace movement act activists like Sally join hands with the environmental movement to shut down nuclear power plants all over and to save the planet from climate disaster, war, and nuclear holocaust. Please welcome Sally Jones. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. I think we should have a big thank you to Catherine Skopik for organizing this wonderful event here. I have been to others and it's always so uplifting and the signs are beautiful and I'm so glad we're here. That small group that we heard about, we're the small group and there's small groups organized all over the city, all over the state, all over the country, all over the world today doing what we're doing. So I feel the link, I feel the energy. For the air, for the water, for the earth, for plant life, wildlife for all life. This year is the most important year in my lifetime to be a peace voter activist. Peace voter is the name Peace Action gives to the, a campaign that brings the values we as peace activists hold dear to the election booth. And as a member of Peace Action of Staten Island, New York State and National Peace Action, I am excited to be here to tell you about it. This year I feel a special passion to encourage everyone I meet to become a peace voter activist. This year we have an opportunity to make a big change in Congress. In two months in New York State on June 26, we will be voting in the congressional primary. You must be registered by June 1st to vote. On September 13th, we will be voting in the state election primaries. You must be registered by August 19th to vote. And on November 6th, we will be voting in the congressional and state general election. You must be registered by October 12th to vote. So why not register now and get everyone you know to register now? Our planet is in even more danger than ever from a U.S. president and his administration that is glorifying war 
and weaponry and selling it around the world and that desecrates the values that we love and respect and is represented by the Green Lady in the Harbor, the Statue of Liberty. Whether you are 18 years or older or not, whether you are ed eligible to vote or not, you can be a peace voter activist. Spending $686 billion on the military budget has to change. Become a peace voter activist and change that. Spending $1.7 trillion for a new nuclear arms race has to change. Become a peace voter activist and change that. Fighting wars in seven separate nations, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Pakistan, Libya, and Yemen, and arming more than half the nations in the world on this planet has to change. Become a peace voter activist and change that. The U.S. backing of the Saudi-led war on Yemen has caused the world's worst humanitarian disaster on the Ye Yemeni people. More than 22 million people, three quarters of Yemeni's population are in desperate need of aid and protection, according to the United Nations. Become a peace voter activist and change that. The Iran nuclear agreement has made the world a safer place. Thanks to years of painstaking negotiations in pursuit of a peaceful means of resolving concerns over Iran's nuclear program. Now the Trump administration is threatening to pull out of that agreement, become a peace voter activist and change that. Bring peace to the Korean Peninsula and prevent, it, prevent any kind of military confrontation there. That requires diplomacy and patience, not confusion and bluster. Become a peace voter activist and change that. Join me in becoming a peace voter activist. Please answer, yes I will, if you agree to these actions. If you are eligible to vote, make sure you are registered to vote. Will you do that? Yes, I will. Whether you are eligible to vote or not, make sure everyone you know is registered to vote. Will you do that? Yes, I will. Let people know you are a peace voter activist and hand them a voter registration form if they, if they are not. I have extra forms with me today. Please take one. Will you do that? Yes, I will. Go to forums and events where you can ask candidates questions, record, and share their answers on social media. Will you do that? Yes, I will. Here are three questions you could choose from. Do you support increasing or reducing the military budget? What do you consider to be the goals of the mission of the U.S. military? Do you believe that the U.S. has a responsibility towards civilian populations harmed by war? And what is your, your view on accepting refugees from those conflicts? Well, you can ask any of those questions. Will you ask one of those questions? Yes, yes I will. Become an active member of a group that is working on peace and social and environmental justice. Will you do that? Yes, I will. Get out to vote and get others to vote on election day. Will you do that? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. And thank you, Catherine, for gathering us today. Although the climate situation is critical, as nationally and globally we are experiencing abnormal weather with extreme results of climate change, there are positive solutions being applied every day to turn the situation around. And I'm just going to mention a few before we wrap up. 
Here in the United States, there are now 105,000 women and men in all 50 states being employed in the wind energy sector with a 9% growth in wind and 99% of wind farms located in rural areas. Wind turbine technician is the second fastest growing occupation after photovoltaic installer, that's solar. <coughs> and this is rather interesting too that um, in Sweden, they've come up with a new innovation for electric vehicles. They put a strip in the middle of the road so when an EV, an electric vehicle, drives on this road, a movable arm comes up to the base of the electric vehicle, much as a tram touches an overhead cable. And as that car is driving on that road, the electric vehicle, it's charging. So this is an e uh, a new innovation that may get us out of the transportation problem. HSBC, the bank has made a small step by making a commitment to stop financing the most carbon intensive energy projects. No financing for new coal, yay, and tar sands. BP, British Petroleum, will place a cap on emissions out to 2025, baby steps to a carbon future decrease to cut off emissions by 3.5 million tons over the next five years. It's a baby step, but it's something. Everything is important. Britain recently went more than two days without any energy from a coal-fired plant, and this spells the end of coal for all of us. Uh, we can do it. We got ourselves into this mess, and many people believe I'm one of them, that if we manage to last long enough, we can surely get ourselves out of it. We may not be able to instantly stop the fossil fuel industry from ruining our climate, although I, for one, would surely like to do so. One place we can make a difference and do have control over is ourselves and our households, where almost every decision we make either helps or hurts Mother Earth. So we can live more mindfully. We can reduce our consumption. Recycle, as Zanaji pointed out he did with his family. Avoid plastics and on and on and on. We can walk or bike when we can, rather than drive. We can keep educating ourselves as to what actions are best to help Mother Earth and live more sustainably. Add up all the households in New York City, New York State, the world, and we've got the job done. Thank you for being here. Happy birthday, happy Earth Day, Mother Earth. Give yourselves a big hand. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, behind you, you'll see a group of dancers from dance2degrees.org. We are dancing to bring attention to the existential problem of climate change. Our idea is to bring attention to the problem and direct people to the websites of some of the best organizations that are fighting climate change and give everybody action steps. What can you do to help end climate change? So we're doing that on behalf of dance2degrees.org and we're working in concert with other organizations that give you steps that you can do today to help fight climate change. Woo.